Okay, so welcome back to Pirkei Avos. We're going to do chapter three, Mishnah two, part two, or Mishnah three, depending on what edition you have. Um, and I, I'm going to uh, lower expectations here, okay? Uh, I can promise you one idea, okay? I, we're going to get at least one idea. Uh, and if we get anything else, that's going to be like frosting on the cake, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so, but I, I, I'm pretty sure I got one idea, okay? So we have here, uh, like I mentioned last time, there's, there's the standard Mishnah on top, and then there's the like most accurate Mishnah on the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and read the most accurate Mishnah, but again, the Rishonim weren't necessarily working with the most accurate Mishnah, so uh, we'll have to see each, you know, each uh, Rishon as they go. Okay, Rabbi Hananiah ben Tradion, or Hanina ben Tradion, I'm going to go with the accurate one, Rabbi Hananiah ben Tradion, Omer says, I'm oh, sorry, Tradion says, Shnaim Shayashvu Shayu Yoshim, okay, two people who were sitting, the Ain Binahim Devi Torah, and there were no words of Torah between them. Harize Moshav Leitim. Behold, this is how would you translate Moshav Leitim? Two words that are difficult to translate. Well, it reads like a clown, like a mockery or like. Okay, so I was hoping someone would fall into the trap. <laughs> okay, because um, in modern Hebrew, I think, is it Latzan or Leitzan means clown or something? Right, Leitzan, I think. So that is one of the worst uh, Hebrew, modern Hebrew words. Uh, you know, there's, not, there, there's some Hebrew, modern Hebrew words that are nice, uh, that like fit and like are extensions of the biblical Hebrew. Uh, uh, I, I wish that you could just like, you could uh, extract that meaning from modern Hebrew speakers' minds uh, because... Leitzan is a clown. A late is much, 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 much worse. Late is one of the greatest categories of Rashayan, uh, one of the worst things you can do. So I just don't think it's it's like beneficial for clowns, for the clown community. And I don't think it's beneficial for the Mishlaid learners to like associate the two words together. Okay, so we're, we're going to define late today. We're going to find uh, uh, two definitions of late. Neither of them will have to do with clowns. Uh, <clears throat> but um, anyone want to just like give a uh, uh, elementary definition for now or translation, I mean? Scorner. Scorner, and mocker. Yeah, scorner, mocker, scoffer. I think those are the three main uh, things. So this is a what? How do you translate Moshav? Settlement of scorners. Yeah, or settlement community is how group. You, yeah, group, group settlement. Uh, so I, you know, uh, I, mm -hmm. I think our scroll likes using the word session, but I feel like session is, has like a therapy connotation, uh, and they're not doing it for therapy. So assembly, uh, assembly of sorry, an assembly of. Of late team again, we will define this late team. Uh, scorners, scoffers, mockers. Okay, um, Shinemar, as it is stated, uh, he does not sit in a I'm just gonna say Moshav late team. Okay, and that's from Tehillim 1 uh, 1. First possible in Tehillim. Okay, about Shnaim Shioshim Vasukim Bidivari Torah, but two who sit and are involved in words of Torah, the Shechina is between them, okay? Uh, and how would you uh, translate Shechina if you had to? Divine presence. Divine presence, okay, yeah. I was going to say, if you, if you say uh, the female side of God, then I'll just take you out of the Zoom room. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Shnemar, as it is stated, Az nidbru yire Hashem ish el reihu. Then, uh, those who fear Hashem spoke each one to the other. Vayakshev Hashem veyishma, and Hashem, uh, um, listened attentively, attentively, and heard. Vayikasev sefer zikaron lefanav, and a book of remembrance, remembrance was written before him, Lir Hashem, for those who fear Hashem, and those who think about his name. Okay, and that is from Malachi 3.16. Oops, sorry. Malachi 3.16. Okay, now, this next part, as you can see, is in parentheses here. In the standard versions of the Mishnah, they have it. Uh, but in the, uh, I guess in the Kaufman accurate edition, then it's in parentheses. I don't know what the parentheses signifies, but I'll go ahead and put it in the parentheses here. Ainly Elishnaim, 
Uh, I only know two. How do I know that even one person, um, who sits and is involved in Torah, that God uh, fixes, establishes a reward for him? Shnemar, as it is stated, Yeshiv Badad Vayidom Kinat Halalav. Okay, this is also a difficult passage to translate. Um, he sits in solitude and is silent. Kinat Halalav, for he, um, uh, for it, for he, <laughs> he bears it upon him. Okay, uh, we'll see different translations of that, or maybe we won't. Okay, yeah. All right, so uh, you know how I said at the beginning of this year, eight minutes ago, that I have one idea? Uh, that idea does not, not include uh, this other clause. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that I didn't get an idea. Okay, the second is that there is another Mishnah in the same chapter that's very similar to this, uh, which uh, God willing, we will do in uh, a matter of weeks. I just want to read to you the other Mishnah just so you can see the difference. Okay, the other Mishnah says in, uh, it's in six, three six. Rabbi Chalavta ben Dosa ish kfar Hanania Omer. Uh, Rabbi Chalavta uh, ben Dosa, the man of the village of Hanania, says, Asara shioshin v'osin v'tora, 10 people who sit and involve themselves in Torah, Shechina shri b'neim, the Shechina is dwelling among them. Shnemar, as it says, Elohim nitzav ba'adas kel. Uminayin afilu chamisha, how do you know even five? Shnemar v'agudasa al eretz yasada. Uminayin afilu shalosha, how do you know three? Shnemar b'kerev elokim yishpot. Uminayin afilu shnaim, how do you know two? Quotes our positive. Shnemar Oz Nidbru Yere Hashem Ish El Rehu Viakshav Hashem Yishma Bugomer. Uminan Shafil Echad, how do you know one? Shnemar, as it says, Bukhola Makam Asher Azkir Eshmi Abu Elecha Virachtifa. So that's really dealing with like, you know, the full range 10, 5, uh, 3, 2, 1. Um, and it's interesting because it quotes the same Pasuk and question and Pasuk for uh, the second clause, but not. Oh, sorry for the for the clause having to do with two of them, not for the one that has to do with one of them. Okay, um, so ours has a different pasuk. He sits in solitude and bears it upon him. So I, I'm kind of tempted to like treat this mishnah as though it is only about two people, because that's the only idea I have. And the other thing also, not only is this part not necessarily in the mishnah, but the rishonim even have drastically different um, uh, like conclusions to the mishnah. So for example. Um, one version says this, how do you know that uh, one who is involved in Torah, that God establishes a reward for him? Another one says, how do you know that uh, even one person who is involved in Torah, it's as if he fulfills the entire Torah, which is a completely different idea. Another one says, how do you know that if one person is involved in Torah, then the Shekhinah is with him, which actually like would seem to make sense given the first part. So I kind of want to just like ignore that for the time being. Um, we, we, we can analyze it, but I kind of want to focus on this part because this will give us enough to work with. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess uh, let us do what we always do, which is asking the questions and problems. Uh, so what do you say here? Yeah, Ella. So just like a small question on the last part. Um, mm -hmm. The part which, well, I guess you know I'm going to, yeah, that part. Like, why do we need a Pusuk to show that someone who learns Torah gets reward? Like, isn't that yeah, like that's a, a good question. mitzvah? <laughs> that's a good question. You know what I'll do? Um, I'm going to do a list of questions on the part we are not analyzing. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so uh, why do we need a Pusuk uh, to show us that uh, a person who learns Torah alone, Torah alone, gets reward and since we're not analyzing this i'll go ahead and give you a hint um uh so l l let's go with your assumption that you don't need a puzzle to show you that uh a person who learns torah alone gets reward um but look at the wording and you can get uh a a hint what's the word that like maybe the Kiddush comes from well, it's like the weird word. So the kovea. Kovea, right? So like, and, and there are mafarshim who, who who like latch onto that, uh, and that's where they get the chiddush. The other, um, the other place where they get the chiddush, and this is weird to me at least, but uh, I, I don't know, is that um, the puzzle literally means yashubadad veidom, one who sits uh, in solitude and is silent, 
And I saw some of Farshim say that like the Chiddush is that you get reward even for thinking about Torah instead of speaking Torah. Okay, whatever. I mean, they're, 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 it's almost like a halachic question. Like, you know, there is a halachic question of, uh, you know, when you say, I, I don't know, you know, I don't actually know what the common minhag is, do, uh, whether women, do women, do you say brachos of Torah every morning? I do. Okay, you do? I'm Sephardi. I don't know how Ashkenazi Okay, yeah, do. yeah. I, I also yeah, have a question about the difference. I do. Okay, fine. Yeah. So um, there's a question of uh, if you just think of Torah, do you have to say the Birkos of Torah beforehand? Certainly before you speak Torah, you have to do that. So I think we poskin that you don't have to, um, you don't have to say the Birkos of Torah before you think Torah, but you do before you speak or write Torah. So like halakhically, thinking Torah is on a lesser level. I don't know why you would think that you don't get reward for it. So all right, that, that's, that's the question we're not, uh, not uh, addressing. Yeah, good question though. All right, Alex. Uh, well, I have one obvious question I assume you want us to pose, which is like, what's the late on? Okay, uh, yeah. What is the right. late? Um, yeah. yeah. And then um, my time? own question that I had. Um, oh, I don't hold know on. How... What happened? Okay, what is that the late? Thing. Yeah, sorry. What is the late in this context? Um, Go ahead. Um, basically, a big question I have, I don't know how relevant it is, but like, why is it exclusive that, you know, uh, for people to be late, they have to not have like, uh, a book out in front of them or to be talking to her because I could easily see someone being like scoffing and etc with the Torah in front of them like being like okay. look at this garbage quoting yeah. it okay good let me think how I want to phrase that okay I, I'm going to put that as a separate question okay which is what um why does the Mishnah treat uh these two groups as mutually exclusive okay what if you are a late who is also engaging in, in Torah learning. Is that your question? Yeah. What would yeah, be, be the status then? Okay. Yeah. Great question. Okay. Uh, Rifki. Yeah. So I think it's like actually very similar, if not the same as what was just asked, but yeah. I was also thinking, cause we, I know that for a fact, I'm pretty sure we've done Mishlei Psukim with Leitzim. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, I feel like in all those Psukim, like their personalities, like we're specifically like literally what their name meant. So yeah. I'm just wondering why, and I guess this is what we were just saying, but like, why is like just sitting there, like considered to be like an act of like a laton because it doesn't like fit. Okay, with let me clarify. Let me clarify the terms. Laton is not a, a biblical Hebrew term. That's the, laton means clown. Okay, late is the term. Late, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's good the yeshiva is driven into me, but yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so basically that's what I'm just wondering because it's not like, I don't see how like, first of all, right. it's bad and i also don't see how it fits with the term okay good all right so i'm going to add that to the first question what is late in this context seemingly uh just because just because you're sitting there and not having words of torah words of torah shouldn't make you a late right uh what if you're not engaging in late like activities because right? I would assume that the Mishnah would say like, oh, and they were saying like Torah is stupid. You yeah, know? right. If they're mocking Torah, definitely right, right. But just seeing they're not doing anything, yeah, yeah. It seems mm -hmm. like the term doesn't match the condemnation. I'll put that here also. Uh, it seems like the uh, the um, the label doesn't uh, correspond with the the uh, the activity. Yeah, and then just a second question on like the second half. Yeah. Um, so in like the quote from Malachi, like, I don't really understand. Like, I feel like the first thing I'm thinking of when we're talking about like, a book of remembrance is like making me think of like Yom Kippur and like Rosh yeah. Hashanah. So yeah. like, what's like the correlation, not specifically with those like Kagim, but like, I guess, like, how does being like a Torah learner coincide with, first of all, like having the Shekinah, but then also like, what's the deal with that quote? Okay. So I'm going to ask this as a broad question, which is, how does the uh, Pasuk from Malachi support the claim made in the Mishnah? Okay, and um, like what do the particulars of the Pasuk mean? And fun fact, uh, fun fact, this is, you know, uh, like I say in my tefillah shirim, every phrase in tefillah comes from, almost every phrase in tefillah comes from a Pasuk. The whole thing of... Um, um, I can never quote tefillah out of context. Kasvinu l'chaim. 
right? So um, uh, that comes from this pasuk, okay? Uh, and if you want an idea from that, then go to my YouTube channel and look up Zachary uh, and And I give it, uh, I think I did five minute Kavana series on it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so broadly speaking, yeah, what does uh, the puzzle do? What are, what are all the details? What does it mean? Book of Remembrance, et cetera. Okay, good. Uh, Lauren. Um, what does um, Shlina mean in this? Yeah, <laughs> okay, good. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, what does Shlina mean in this context? Yeah, good. Important question, <laughs> central question. Yeah, uh, Alex? Um, in terms of the last part with the quote, do you specifically have to fear Hashem to like get that like book of remembrance or reward? Like, what is it about the fear specifically that gets yeah. you that? Okay. Why the emphasis on fear of Hashem as the thing that gets you written, uh, or that gets this book written for you? Uh, yeah. Uh, Yala? So, Adding on to Lauren's question about Shrina, yeah. what does it mean that the Shrina is between them or like Shora? Benahim, okay, guess, good. Is the word? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, and I just want to check and see if the uh, if the standard, yeah. So the standard editions of the Mishnah use the term Shrina Shriya Benahim, which means like Shriya literally means like steeped between them. Uh, and then the, 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 um, Kaufman edition of the Mishnah just says Shechina Binahim. So I'm going to go ahead and do our usual policy of like assuming that the term is not like critical, but but the Binahim is critical. What does it mean that the Shechina, what does it mean that the Shechina is between them? Yeah, Vanessa? Nope. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yael? Yeah, this is more of a general methodology question, yeah. but the terms that we have from Mishle, like you're applying the same lates from Mishle. So can we assume that like Shlomo was using this terms the same way as Chazal and as Sukim do? Not or necessarily. Not That's a good question. Yeah, not necessarily. Uh, and the reason why I say that is, um, is, uh, and I, this is more from my own experience. Shlomo, I know, coined many terms and also took pre-existing phrases and words and then made them into Mishle jargon. Uh, and use them in different ways than than were necessarily used before him. So it's not necessarily going to be the same meaning as in Mishlei. Okay, and we're going to see that when we do uh, when we answer that question. Yeah, Vanessa. I have less of a question, more of a response, which might generate questions. Okay, if that's okay. Or should we do uh, that later? Uh, hold off for just one second. We'll just get all okay. the questions first, then you can give a response. Yeah, Lauren. Um, another question. I don't know if this is really a question, but I was wondering, like, when it says the Ein Bnei Hashem Divrei Torah. Yeah. Do they have to be involved in uh, Lima Torah, or is it like what? What does okay, it mean good question. that there's no Torah between them, yeah. or else that there are Sukkim Medivrei Torah? Okay. Like it's kind of like I don't know what the bounds of Torah. Okay, what are. level of Torah? What level of Torah? Oh, oopsies. What level of Torah involvement or lack thereof um, places you in either of these categories? That's an important question. Um, like, is it um, like? Like, in other words, how much Torah can you be involved in other conversation? Um, does this extend to, like, is this, let's say, is this specifically learning? Or does this extend to other things, right? Like, like doing mitzvos, right? Or chachma in general, okay? Yeah, what are, what, what are the parameters? Also, like, I, I don't know if it's this Mishnah, but I remember, like, growing up learning that, like, every time you have a meal, you should say a Dvar Torah, and ah, if you don't so, have yeah. a Dvar Torah at the meal. I actually meant to, different Mishnah? yeah, that is different. Uh, I actually meant to raise that possibility. Let me just see um, uh, if that's in the same. I'll just read to you so you can see the contrast. Uh, I don't know what parak it's in. Hold on a second. Ziv, uh, hey. Uh, it is in, oh, would you look at that? It's the next Mishnah. <laughs> the next Mishnah. Okay, so maybe next week. Rabbi Shimon Omer Shloshesh Akhla Al Shulchan Akhav Lo Amra Alav Devi Torah, Kilo Akhlu Mizif Chemesim. So it doesn't um, it doesn't mention Shrina. Okay, so I guess we'll have to we'll have to do that later. All right, thematically appropriate then, uh, uh, or at least uh, thematically classic. Yeah. 
yeah. Uh, Rifki. Yeah, just question on that last question. Yeah. Um, I guess it's more of like a methodology question about Perkyavos because I'm like not like a pro. Um, Neither am I. <laughs> so are we, just because I know like in the beginning, like our Mahalaif is that we assume that this is written for people on like a higher level. Yeah. So should we assume like just inherently that whatever level it is, is a higher level than let's say like a basic person or should we not go on with that assumption? I'm going with that assumption, but it's not a unanimous assumption. Uh, and even according to those who go with the assumption that this is written for a higher level person or someone who's trying to become a chassid, uh, it doesn't mean that it's irrelevant for ordinary people. It just means that you have to like take it in stride, uh, apply it to yourself on, on a developmentally appropriate level. You know, um, yeah, Ayala? So the first supporting Pusuk, yeah. um, it seems like it's not really like, supporting the claim it seems like it's just okay, saying good. like Hashem doesn't sit in Moshe Leitzim, but what the claim is saying okay. is that this is a case of Moshe Leitzim. so okay, it's like good. kind of backwards okay good circular how, how does the um the uh how does Tehillim Aleph Aleph support the claim uh the, the the first claim uh yeah um right it seems uh yeah, by the way, the he is not Hashem. I don't know if you were thinking of it as Hashem. Yeah, the he is just a person. Okay, so it's not, it doesn't even seem to support the claim at all. Yeah. Yeah, Rufki? Yeah, um, how does learning Torah and having like Yeras Hashem go together? Okay, you're, you're asking that because uh, the Pasuk in yeah. Malachi talks about fear of Hashem. Yeah, okay, good. I'm going to add that to the question of. Yeah. Um, how does the Tana use a Pusuk about, oops, uh, about Yuras Hashem to, pr uh, to prove this point about learning Torah? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, Ayala. Just question five. I don't think we asked about how the relationship works between learning Torah and the Shekhinah dwelling between them? Uh, correct. Um, how does learning Torah um, cause the Shina to be to be between them? Okay. Is that it? Somebody uh, no, no, no. I think that's about it. I mean, we could dissect the puzzle more, but I think that's about that's about it. Okay, so Vanessa, you had a what do you call it? A move a that might thought. Be and the more I think about it, the more I think I'm more just like grasping at straws and being reminded of something. So maybe I'll just like say it, and people sure. can debate it. Not even debate, just like I don't know. This whole I like don't have questions, and I think it's because I'm like assuming in my head that this is about like lush and I've been like trying to. I've been bad about it for two yeah. weeks, but I've been trying to go through the Chafetz Chaim. Yeah. Um, yeah. And every day, and like a big thing he says is like, if you're, if the people are talking around you, it's better for you to get yourself up and go walk alone. And like, right. if you can't make them stop, like go sit alone. Yeah. And the, I don't know what you call it, the quote that you put aside. I think that yeah. was in, I think that's in my edition of Perkei Albert. I could be wrong, but it seemed familiar. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is because it's in most of them. Yeah. Okay. So it just, that like really reminds me because. I don't know how to translate. I'm not the greatest with Hebrew, but like it really emphasizes the solitude part. Yeah. And like the fact that he's in solitude and he's silent, just like, I don't know, that reminded me of like someone who like, especially in the context of Perkei Abba, right? Like we're trying, there's people who like want to be a chassid. Like, yeah, that's like, a, that's like a pious behavior to like really separate yourself and just like, yeah. I don't need to go to all level to get up and leave the thing. And like, I don't know, the language, like calling them like team Moshe. Yeah, I definitely see how this would be reminiscent of uh, that principle. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, and I agree that it's not a question, but it's a uh, association. Yeah, I think it. I raise it more because it like not that it answers the first question, but like it makes I don't know. It makes me more comfortable with the first question because like in the concept of lashon har, it's because like even if you're not actually speaking lashon har, the idea might be like if you're not focused on holy things, whatever we're gonna call them, that's like a different question. Yeah, then it could like devolve into lashon har. Right. Okay. That's a, that is definitely a fair point. Uh, um, is it? Yeah. I'm not convinced myself, which is okay, why I'm like, no, no, I, 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 
Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. Okay, so uh, anyone else have any answers to these questions? I don't know whether to put the questions on the screen or the text on the screen. So just tell me where to go. <laughs> Here, just, what I'll I'll do is I'll put the, I'll, I'll copy and paste this and put it in the chat, maybe. That's smart. Um, now I just had a question on um, my question from earlier of like why are we assuming that being a late is like in this context like correlated with specifically not speaking words of Torah? Yeah. So. I'm just wondering, can we say that like not speaking words of Torah means that they are like scoffing at Torah? Like, could we say that it's like the antithesis of Torah or is that too big of a step? It's a good question. So um, I, okay, I debated how to go about approaching uh, this when teaching it because a lot of them are actually make a big move. I think we're going to be on, on, on barking up the wrong tree until we see this move. So that's why I'm wondering, like, is it going to be good? Should I let, should I let people think their thoughts before I make this move, or should I make the move and then let you think your thoughts? Uh, yeah. Should we <laughs> just make it a question? Because that's also exactly why I was uncomfortable talking at all. Because I was like, I don't know if that's too much of a stuff. Okay. So you know what? I, I let me make one move first. Okay, from the Beniona. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm skipping down to Beniona. Okay. Yeah. You could go the other way and say that by not learning Torah, then you will fall to like late behavior because you're not like immersing yourself in like things that will lead you to better behaviors. Okay, that is true. Okay, I I'm gonna go ahead and make the move. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm realizing that I think it's gonna be the best for us. So Rubino Yona uh, delivers, okay, as he often does in Pirkei Avos. So he says like this, um, Ruby Hanania ben Tradion says, two people who were sitting and, oh, well, one methodology point, by the way, because I don't know why there are different, uh, so many different editions of Pirkei Avos, but you know when you're reading a Mefar, uh, you're, when you're reading Mefarshim on a pasuk, okay, why is it important to look at the deeper Hamaskil? Just general methodology. Sorry, could you translate? Yeah, when you are looking at commentators on a uh, on a pasuk on a verse in Tanakh. Why is it important to look at the bolded words that they open their commentary with? And this is not a trick question. And if you don't do this, then you should do this. <laughs> okay. Always look at like when you see a Rashi, for example, like, like oh, you open a, a Rashi on. Uh, uh, hold on. Here goes Kadolos. Parsha Sashavua. Rashi. Okay. This is basic methodology, right? Lech Lecha. Okay. That's Dibra Moscow. It's bold. Um, the S called the Goigado. Why, why is it important to look at the deeper Moscow? Because they're commenting on that word. They're commenting on those words. Okay. So in Tanakh, that's why you look at, and not just Tanakh, in Gemara also, then you should look at the commentary um, to see primarily what it is that they're commenting on. Okay. But in Pirkei Avos, there is a, another reason that's, that does not apply to Tanakh, but it applies to really. Um, it applies to, to uh, uh, you know, to Mishnah and Gemara, which is that they might have a different version of the text than the one that we have. Okay, so um, here, there's no difference. We actually had it in last week. Okay, but I, I, that's why I also replicate the um, the deeper Hamaskil, the the bolded portion for each of the um, uh, Mefarshim here. Okay, so just just as general methodology. Okay, so he says like this. There are two phenomena called late sanos. And I chose to translate this as uh, to just transliterate it because I don't want to, you, you'll see when we go through the definitions that it's best to keep it vague or to, sorry, to keep it untranslated so you can like fill in the proper definitions. So there are two phenomena called late sanos. The first is Lush and Hara, uh, like, um, like Vanessa was saying, one who speaks negatively about his fellow to shame him and degrade him among others and to establish him as one who is degraded in their eyes. This is one of the biggest sins that a person can do and incur. This trait is, is only found uh, in someone who has a bad character. Regarding him, Shlomo in his wisdom said, now this is one of the few psukim in Mishle where it literally just defines the Mishlaic um, uh, personality. Zaid Yahir Leitz Shemo Oseb Be'ever Zadon. The Zaid, malicious, Yahir, arrogant one, Leitz Shemo. His name is Leitz. Oseb Be'ever Zadon. He acts in the fury of malice. That's how I'm translating it, but he'll explain. Oh, that's Mishlei 2124. This means to say that there are two, that these two bad character traits, malice and arrogance, are both found in the late. 
Malice, Zaid, which is the same word as Zadon or Mezid, refers to someone who speaks about his fellow and degrades him in the eyes of the world. Uh, so he basically just wants to like, like make this guy like uh, look bad. Arrogance refers to his thoughts that no person has esteem in his eyes. So that's like haughtiness, like I'm the only one who like is great. Everyone else is just uh, is nothing. One who is crowned with these two things is called a late. And perhaps you'll say that even though he doesn't guard his speech, his hands are bound and he won't sit in action. Okay, in other words, maybe you'll say, okay, this guy's all bark and no bite. Right? He just talks and yeah, he says Lashon Hara, but he's not going to actually do anything. Regarding this, Shlomo said, he acts in the fury of malice. This man whose name is Leitz will act in anger and cruelty for his Leitzanus indicates that he will sin in action without a doubt. Shlomo Melch consoles those who hear it. You know what I'm going to do? Executive decision. I want to read the Rabbinic Yonah's commentary on that puzzle in Mishlei because it elaborates even more. Never hurts to review the, the definition of a Leitz. Okay, he says like this. Zaid Yahir Leitz Shemo, Oseb Ever I don't have this in English. So it says, Lushan Zaid, the, the term Zaid, which I translate as malice or malicious, Kolal Achzarius, Vesinas Abrios, Vahasimcha Edam Udrishas Rasan. It includes cruelty, hatred of people, rejoicing at their misfortune, and seeking out their harm. Okay, so that's why I think malice is the best word in English for it. Vyahir, Hubal Gaiva. Yahir means a haughty person. Ubir Inyan, the explanation is as follows. The person who has these two midos in his soul, uh, malice and arrogance, his name is late. The late includes them. He's someone who speaks Lashon Hara uh, uh, professionally. And he scoffs and he mocks people. That's the ultimate act of malice. He damages with his tongue his friends or his fellows. He shames them and he insults them and he diminishes their, their uh, esteem. Not in order to get some sort of like tangible uh, benefit. Like not, you know, it's one thing if like you um, speak badly about your business competitor so that you get more business. This guy will do it even if he's not getting any tangible, tangible benefit. This is worse than the guy who uh, causes harm for uh, monetary uh, gain. And if you join that character trait of malice with arrogance and haughtiness, when he intends to blemish his friends, um, uh, so that no one has uh, any uh, superiority over him. And also in, in the, the, the great, his great arrogance, he will blemish and diminish uh virtues in other words he'll make fun of virtues not just people uh like he'll say like oh you're a nice person nice is so dumb you know uh like uh, you know this guy's just like wasting his money giving to tzedakah the ininu roi benafshu echamin v'gaim he will not see in himself any one of these blemishes the ilu hishgiach al-pagamav if he were to look at his own blemishes nichlam hayam hiyos baz v'log v'zulaso he would be too ashamed to disparage and mock another person uh, Chazal say that a Baal Lashon Hara, someone who speaks Lashon Hara a lot, is comparable to a snake who damages without any sort of uh, uh, like pleasure. Um, uh, he is worse than a lion who will uh, uh, like uh, maul you and eat. Or like a wolf who tears you and eats. Not that we know anything about wolves. And they have, um, uh, they have a benefit in this. It says in uh, Kohelis, there's no gain to the Baal Hara. Okay, so that's the late. Okay, then he says, The guy who has these two traits, Don't think that the only sin he has is, uh, is the sin of uh, speech. And, don't, uh, and that he won't sin in action. That's not true. He will. He and his fellows will engage in the in the wrath of malice. As soon as he gets angry at a person, he will harm him. And he'll act with him in the wrath of malice. There's no anger like the anger of someone who has a lashon hara. We know that if you're haughty, that increases the anger. So guy who has these two midos will damage nearly destroys. Okay, so that's the portrait of the lates. Okay. Okay, any questions on that, on the personality? I mean, this is a whole topic, but, you know, I'll take questions.
Is it saying what's causing him to do this? I mean, I don't think it is. I guess what's causing him to do this? Uh, mm, yes and no. He's not saying it, but you can infer that the haughtiness has something to do with it. You know, that he wants to view himself as being better than everybody. And, uh, and Rubino did hint at, he says he doesn't want anyone to have any uh, advantage over him. So he'll put people down in order to make himself feel superior. But it also seems like there is a natural uh, arrogance, oh, sorry, a natural aggressiveness that he has as well. Okay, so um, okay, so after this beautiful portrait of the late, Rabini Yona says, we're not talking about this kind of late in our, in our Mishnah, okay? And that's why I wanted to go over this move, okay? He says, but the Pasuk that says, B'moshev leitim lo yashav, in the assembly of leitim he does not sit, isn't talking about the leitim we mentioned, okay? For they would be included in the category of sinners or evildoers mentioned at the beginning of the Pasuk. Okay, the beginning of the Pasuk says, oh, you know what I didn't show you? I didn't show you the Pasuk in Tehillim. Okay, so the Tehillim says like this. Happy slash praiseworthy is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the path on the path of sinners, and does not sit in the assembly of Leitim. Okay. But only in the Torah of Hashem is his desire, and he thinks about his Torah day and night. Okay, so Rabbeinu is saying, don't think that the Leitim in our Pasuk is the one that is defined in Mishle, because if so, they would be included in Chataim and Rashaim, in sinners and the wicked. Okay, so who are we talking about then? He says, rather, an assembly of Leitim is the term for the opposite of what is stated afterwards, but only in the Torah of Hashem is his desire, and he thinks about his Torah day and night, which, by the way, methodology point, okay, you, you probably noticed this, that I try to do this a lot. Whenever a puzzle is quoted, I try to look it up in context. So here is the best example I've ever seen in my entire life about why you should look this up in context, okay? Our Mishnah only quotes the Pasuk Tehillim 1.1, okay, which is he does not sit in the Moshe of late team. Every single commentator quotes Pasuk 1, 2 in Tehillim and says that the idea comes from 1, 2, okay? Because if you read them together, then you get the answer to the question about how the Pasuk 1 proves the idea. It says, he doesn't sit in the assembly of, uh, of Leitim, but only in the Torah of Hashem is his desire, you know? So like, you wouldn't know that, uh, like that's what makes it a um, binary, uh, is that the term? Yeah, like it's either this or that, you know? Um, so that's what Rabbi Yona says. He says that rather an assembly of Leitim is the term for the opposite of what is stated afterwards, but only in the Torah of Hashem is his desire. And he thinks about his Torah day and night. Namely, people who gather specifically with the intention of speaking about meaningless things and abstaining from words of Torah, who cast off its yoke from upon themselves, except in the time when they have no work. They also don't need to speak about their matters and they establish a set time to gather for matters of nonsense. This is called an assembly of Leitim and is said regarding Bittal Torah. For this chapter of P.K. Alvis talks about the topic of Bittal Torah. Okay, so in other words like this, we are not talking about people who speak Lashon Hara. If you're people who are speaking Lashon Hara, then you're even worse than what the Mishnah is talking about. Then you're a Russia or a Chote, okay, a, a evildoer or a sinner. Here we're talking about the quality of late, meaning someone who is, is uh, guilty of Bittal Torah, of not using Torah time. And where do we get this from? So there's a Rabbeinu Yona in another Pasuk in Mishle, which I want to read to you, which says, Mishle 14.6, Bikesh leitz chachma v'ayin v'das l'navon nakal. The leitz looks for wisdom and it is not there, but knowledge is easy for the understanding person. So here Rabbeinu Yona says, the leitz is someone who is involved in idle conversations and also scoffs at people and mocks their actions and words. It is impossible to have this trait unless one has uh, negated uh, fear of God. How did I, how did I translate that? Me beauty, uh, bit, bitul hamora. Yeah. Negating, uh, fear of God and has cast off the yoke of Torah. These two traits that are mentioned, namely idle conversation and scoffing distance a person from wisdom for wisdom is found is not found in, uh, okay. The, the term that the Chazal use is, uh, Yoshve Kronos people who sit on corners. Okay. Um, the, the, Okay. I don't know why this is the imagery that comes to my mind because I've never seen people like this in, in my life. But what I'm picturing here is uh, is rich women in mink coats that are sitting, drinking mimosas and like gossiping with each other. 
uh like and that, that that's all they do like walking with the little chihuahuas and like they get together every morning and like just like sit there and gossip you know um I, you know I, i'm sure there there there's an equivalent for men as well but like uh that's what i picture i think i picture it because like that's why they gather you know uh like they're just sitting together to talk about these things thus you will find it only you'll find it in those who learn you will hold on oh yeah sorry wisdom he's talking about wisdom uh, thus you will find it, meaning wisdom, in, uh, in those who learn in awe, not in late who in all fear. Okay, and then he, uh, he brings more proofs. So bottom line here is Rabbeinu Yonah is answering a couple of our questions. Okay, first of all, he's answering the question, what is a late in this context? And those who are in my Mishle Shirim know that I always add the words in this context. And this is a great example of why, because the normal context Lace is a scoffer or a mocker. In this context, it's someone who is just involved in Bittal Torah and who's involved in uh, idle conversation, okay? And this also answers the question of, um, you're not engaging in Lace-like activities. Yeah, if Lace-like activities means arrogance and malicious speech, then you're not engaging in that. But if Lace means you're involved in idle chatter, then that is a Lace activity, okay? So that is uh, the Lace in this context. Okay, that's an important move. How does the first pasuk support the claim? It doesn't. You need the first two psukim, which is that, um, where did I put it? Yeah. Uh, Happy or praiseworthy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who doesn't stand on the path of sinners, who doesn't sit in the assembly of the late team, but his desire is only in the Torah of Hashem. So this is where you see that it is a binary thing, that either you are involved in the assembly of late team or you are involved in Torah. Now, it doesn't fully answer it because you could, you could still have the question uh, that was asked, which is, what if you're doing both, right? Um, question number three, okay? Um, we still need to answer that. And I think Rubina Yona doesn't answer the other questions, okay? So any questions on these, this move so far? Okay, next move. Okay, I'm not going to the idea. I'm just giving you the, 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 the steps, okay? Uh, Next move is from, okay, we're doing this differently also than I usually do on uh, in Pirkei Havas. I'm taking bits and pieces from several Mepharshim, and then we're getting an idea from one. Okay, so the next bit and piece comes from, uh, let's do the Rambam. Okay, the Rambam says, Parizei Moshe Leitim, his proof that an assembly of Leitim is what we call any assembly in which they don't speak about the exalted Torah is from the next Pasuk, which says, so I think speak of, yeah, this is a kind of a vague phrase of the exalted Torah, okay? It doesn't mean that you're speaking about how great Torah is, but it means that you're talking about the, the Torah itself, uh, whether about Torah or in Torah, is from the next passage, which says, but only in the Torah of Hashem, of Hashem is his desire. It is as if he said, because his desire is in the Torah of Hashem, he does not sit in an assembly of Leitim in which there is no Torah of Hashem. Okay, subtle move here. What is the Ramam saying? I'll read it again. Because his desire is in the Torah of Hashem, he does not sit in an assembly of Leitim in which there is no Torah of Hashem. Maybe it's talking about the people that he like interacts with. Like okay, he good. only hangs out with people that like foster his growth and yeah. development. And, okay, good, and good. Good. So in other words, like this, when you first read the Mishnah, it makes it sound like you're sitting there with your friend and once you speak words of Torah, then the Shania goes zoop, and like swoops down, right? And if not, then you're not there, right? But what the Ramam seems to be saying is, uh, like Lauren said, is the fact that he seeks out groups of people where, where there will be words of Torah, that's really what the quality that causes the Shekhinah to be there. Obviously, he has to be talking about Torah also. But in other words, he won't be found in a, 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 an assembly of Leitim because those are people who don't talk Torah. So it's the cause, not the... Uh, I don't know if that makes any. I was saying it's cause, not the effect. I don't know if that that does nothing. Okay, uh, and I want to show you also that um, yeah. So this is an example where, like, uh, you know, sometimes when you have the uh, the correct text of something, then certain words lock into place. So the standard text says Shanaim Shiyoshim Ve'ain Be'nehem Divrei Torah, two who are sitting and there are no words of Torah. The correct text is Shnaim Shehayu Yoshim Ve'im Binehem Divrei Torah, two who were sitting and there's no words of Torah between them. I, 
I, I don't think you could like derive anything from this like on its own, but it fits in with the Ramam's idea really well, which is that like, if you look at this group of people that they sat there the whole time and they didn't talk Torah, evidently that's a Moshe Avlei team. Those people don't value Torah because if they value Torah, they would have talked about it. So it's like a, this is what we call like a, uh, it's like a barometer. It's like a litmus test. You know, is this a group of people who value Torah who the Shechina is with? that will be manifest by the fact that they, they have words of Torah between them. And if they don't, then that's not a group that the screen is with. And that's like a Moshe of late team. Yeah. Ayala. I'm not sure if the Rambam answers my question. My question is more on Rabbi and Yonah. Yeah. But it's about like originally the first line of the Mishnah seemed like, Should I go like why, like a big jump. Yeah. Yeah. But after Rabbi Yona, it seems like it's obvious and it's not really adding anything new. I guess if you say like the raw mom, then it is adding. It's like telling you who to be around. Right. But yeah. Um, so um, so I, I uh, you're right. I don't think he's answering that. Uh, but I think I'll answer it when we get to the main idea. OK. Yeah. OK. So this is uh, um, uh, what do you call it? This is move number two. OK. Which is that. Um, that this is really a, a statement about the kind of group that you're talking about, uh, that this guy will be in a, I mean, look, it flows from the Pesach and Tehillim actually really well. Just read the Pesach, just plain shot of the Pesach, uh, Pesach and Tehillim. Uh, happy slash, wait, where did it go? Uh, was it below? Tehillim. Do I keep scrolling past it? Yeah, I must keep scrolling past it. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, yeah, got to make it italics. Uh, ha- praiseworthy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who doesn't stand on the path of sinners, who doesn't sit in the assembly of the team, but his desire is only in the Torah of Hashem. It's describing a person who doesn't choose to sit with people who are not involved in Torah, but he is involved in, uh, in the Torah of Hashem. Okay, now, third and final move before, the, before I'll open it up for questions again, and then I'll, I'll tell you what I think. Um, uh, this one is going to cause all of us, I think, to breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, it's four now. Okay, two who sit and there are no words of Torah between them. This is an assembly of Leitim. Who sit, okay, even though their conversation contains no words of scoffing. Okay, so he's he's taking the same move as Rabbeinu Yonah. Like, don't think that we're only talking about people who are scoffing. He says, since their words contain no words of Torah, they are considered an assembly of Leitim. The entire content of which is nothingness and a temporal matter. In Hebrew, that is... Hevel v'davar nifsad. Hevel is like a nothing that's a futility or vanity, and davar nifsad is something that's just like like uh, it's just going to go away. Rabbi Hanania brought a proof from this, from that which is written, and in an assembly of leitim he does not sit, but only in the Torah of Hashem is his, is his desire. In other words, any assembly is an assembly of leitim except for one where there are words of Hashem's Torah. Now I don't know if you caught it, okay, but I'll I'll say the question and you tell me what Sforno's answer is. Um, how much of the conversation uh, has to be about Torah? to re- be removed from the category of Moshe of Leitim. Just some. Some, okay. And it fits into the words really well. Shnayim shiyoshim ve'ein b'nehem divrei Torah, two people who sit and there are no words of Torah between them, versus two who sit, um, and I mean, it, it would have been perfect if it said v'yesh b'nehem divrei Torah. It says, uh, what does our Mishnah say? It says, um, and the standard edition says, yeah, the standard edition here actually is better. Torah. Okay. So according to Sforno, uh, okay, so we can kind of answer this question now. Okay. Uh, why is the mission to treat these two groups as mutually exclusive? What if you are late to is in, involved in, in Torah learning? So according to the way we're defining late, then you might be, okay, you might be a late in terms of your personality, but if you are sitting in a group of, with another, with a friend, and you have any words of Torah between you, so you're out of the category of Moshe of Leitim, and you're into the category of Shekhinah's with you, and that obviously is subject to degrees, right? Like, if your entire conversation is about Torah, that's obviously better than, like, if some of it is about Torah, but all you need is Yesh Binem Divrei Torah, okay? So we're, we're good there. Um, that's the third move. Mm. Okay, so now, anyone want to try answering our remaining questions? Our questions are, how does Malachi support it? What does Shechina mean? Um, actually, I think this question has to come first because Malachi is really support for that. How does learning Torah cause the Shechina to be between them? Um, and then, um, oh, we said this. 
how what level of Torah involvement um, can get you in either category? So we answer that. So we really have these three questions: like where's Shechina mean? How does learning Torah cause the Shechina to go be between them? And then how does the puzzle from Malachi support the claim? Um, let me ask you a question: Do you want to try to answer for yourself, or do you want me to go over a, a crash course in Shechina? Okay, I'm seeing nods from the people I can see on my screen. Okay, so let me go over a crash course in Shechina. I don't know how many of you heard this year. This is the very first year I gave at Y. Uh, no, oh yeah, first year I gave at my job at YBT, which was Tishabov 2020. Okay, um, so uh, this is an excerpt from the PowerPoint. Um, okay, I think I'm sharing the whole screen. Can you see the PowerPoint? Oops, no, not anymore. Hold on. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is in the context of, of a, uh, a, um, a Tishabov shear. We're not going to talk about the context. Uh, so I end with a question, what, is the heck, what, what the heck do you mean by Shechina? Okay, so um, so we're going to go over several definitions of Shechina, and I'm not going to use all of them for our shear, but this is basically like I took everything I knew about Shechina and put it into one PowerPoint. Okay, so this is the crash course. Okay, so what does the verb Shachin mean? Well, well. well. Okay, yeah, to dwell. Oh, sorry, I guess I have three questions. Oh, all right, three questions. What does the verb shachin mean? What is the meaning of mishkan not as tabernacle? And by that, I mean, the, we all know that the mishkan is the, the portable, like basic mikdash in the, in the, in the uh, what do you call, in the um, uh, midbar. Okay, but the term mishkan is also used for something else. And then what do we mean, what do chazal mean by shachina? These are the three uh, questions I want to answer. So, so Ramam in the Mornavuhim 125 says shachin. It is known that the meaning of this verb is to dwell. And thus, he dwelt in the plains of Mamre. That's this week's Parsha. Yeah. Uh, and it came to pass while Israel dwelt. Okay, so it means dwelling. Okay, this is well known and generally accepted. Now, dwelling signifies a continuous stay in a place of one's abode. All right. So that's the difference between dwelling and like being or sitting or like, you know, uh, whatever. Like that's the, the Hebrew term for a temporary dwelling is gar. And yashav is like a more firm, but shachin is like even more than that, I guess. Accordingly, when a living being has his abode in a place by which either a general or a particular place may be meant, it is said of him that he dwells in that place, even if he undoubtedly moves within it. So in other words, dwelling doesn't mean sitting still. It means, generally speaking, being in a certain region, even if you are uh, mobile. Okay. This verb, so th that was, those were the literal meanings of, of Shachin. Now he's going to go to the figure of meanings and how we use it about Hashem. This verb is also used figuratively, oh, not, not Hashem yet, sorry, uh, figuratively. This verb is also used figuratively applied to things that are not living beings, and in fact, to everything that is continuous and is attached to another thing. Of all such things, the term dwelling uh, may be used, even in cases in which the thing to which they are attached is not a place, and they themselves are not living things. Thus it says, let a cloud not dwell upon the day, uh, for there is no doubt that a cloud is not a living being, nor a day in any way a body being a portion of time. Okay, so so he's just saying that it's used figuratively uh, in the same way that it's continually on something. Okay, now we get to God. It is on account of this latter figurative sense that the verb apply, is applied figuratively to God, may he be exalted. I mean to the continuity of his shechina or his hashgacha. Okay, hashgacha, his providence, a supervision, in whatever place they may subsist in a continuous fashion or towards whatever matter providence may be continuously directed. Thus it is said, and the glory of Hashem dwelt, uh, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, and the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. In every case in which this occurs with the reference to God, it is used in the sense of the continuity of his shechina, I mean his or hanivra, his created light, in a place, or the continuity of hashgacha with regard to a certain matter. Each passage should be understood according to its context. Okay, um, so he's saying like this, he's saying shachi means to dwell, which means to be continuously with something. And when you use it about God, it either means his hashgacha, God's providence, being someplace uh, constantly, or his created light. Okay, and we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, onward. Oh, so, so not onward. So this is in 125 in the morning of Buchim. Earlier, the Ramam talks about this idea of a created light. He says, um, in this sense, the, when we talk about the, uh, he's talking about the meaning of kavod Hashem and male, that uh, kavodo, the entire earth is filled with the glory of Hashem. He says, in this sense, it is said the, the whole world is filled, full of his glory. The meaning of this verse is that the whole earth bears witness to his perfection, that is, indicates it. Similar in its dictum, and the glory of Hashem filled the tabernacle. Every mention of male, filling, 
that you will find referring to God is used in the sense and not in the sense of there being a body filling a place. Okay, then he says, however, if you wish to think that the glory of Hashem is the created light, the Or Nivra, that is designated as glory in every passage, and that is what filled the tabernacle, there's no harm in this. Okay, so when you read this, if you're sensitive to the way that the Ram talks, you're like, what does he mean? Like, if you want to view it this way, then there's no harm in it. Okay, so this is where um, you have to like read between the lines. Okay, so which of the following represents the uh if you're on audio you can't see the screen which of the following best represents the ramam's facial expression when he gives the reader a permission to believe that the kavod hashem is a created light is he wholeheartedly endorsing it is he winking at you is he like you know <laughs> being like yeah sure is he rolling his eyes or is he alluding to the fact that there's a secret so i think <laughs> that he's not wholeheartedly endorsing this view okay the ramam will sometimes do this is he'll give you the true idea, and then he'll say, if you want to believe X, Y, Z, then that's fine. Okay, my favorite example of this is he's talking about uh, in the, the essay on resurrection of the dead, he says, um, he's talking about like how the masses think that the only things that are real are physical. So they have a hard time thinking about God as not being a physical being. So he says, you know, if you think about God as being physical, then you hold, you know, then you're worshiping a being other than Hashem, and then you're denying God. He says, and angels are not physical, but the masses have a very hard time thinking of angels as, as, uh, as being non-physical. And if they want to think of angels as physical, then there's no harm in it. Okay. So it's like, really, when you go back and you read this, really, the, my contention is the Ramam holds that, uh, that Shekhinah means Hashgacha in a continual manner. Okay. Uh, God's providence in a continual manner. And when he says this thing that uh, the Or Hanivra, what he means is, let's say you are an average Jew who doesn't have these abstract ideas of God's Hashgacha being in a place. So the Ramam says, if you want to think to yourself that in the Kodesh HaGadashim, there is a light that God created, okay, not God, not God himself, but a light that he created, and that light is like a proof of God's glory, and we call that the Shekhinah, he's like, okay, you can believe that, all right, but the real meaning of Shekhinah is the Hashgacha, okay. So we answer our first question, what does the verb shachin mean? Uh, Ramam says it refers to the continuity of God's hashgacha or created light in a particular place. Okay, what about mishkan? So here's what I meant uh, when I said not the um, uh, tabernacle. There's a puzzle in Vayikra 2611 that says, I will place my dwelling among you and I myself will not abhor you. Okay, and that's not talking about the mishkan. This is in the brachas and Kualos. So... Rav David Tzvi Hoffman, which is one of uh, Rav Hirsch's contemporaries, says, "Venasati Mishkani, I will place my dwelling. He ha'hashgacha elokis ha'gluya. This is the manifest divine providence which determines the fate of Israel. Now, what do you think he means by um, by manifest, by gluya, like as opposed to what? Like hidden in the laws of nature, as opposed to hidden, right? Yeah. So." So if it's hidden, we don't, he's saying we don't call that uh, God dwelling, okay? It, I mean, even if it is Hashgaka, we don't call it God dwelling, okay? Um, okay, so that is what Rav David Tzvi Hoffman says. Mishkan means, uh, Mishkan refers to the manifest divine providence which determines Israel's fate. And then the last thing is, what does Chazal mean by Shechina? Uh, I have heard no interpretation better than Rabbi Chait's. So Rabbi Chait explained that uh, the Torah Shbichsav only uses the verb of Shachin, but never the noun of Shechina, Okay. So what is Shechina? Shechina is a noun that was invented by Hazal, okay? And the grammatical term is it's a gerund, which is a nounified verb, okay? For example, if you say, so to swim is a verb, but we, uh, so when you say, I am swimming in the ocean, you're using it as a verb. But if you say, I love swimming, so then you're using swimming as a noun, the same way you say, like, I love Seattle, okay? So you're treating the verb as a noun. Okay, so it's, uh, gerunds are very handy because you could talk about actions which are temporal phenomena as though they are things. So, um, so that's what I mean by the nounification of a verb. Okay, so the nounification of the verb swim is a gerund. So, Rabbi Chait explained, Chazal took the verb of shachin and rendered it into a gerund. Why? In order to be able to speak of Hashem's actions as a noun to enable a clear expression of ideas without speaking falsely. So, in other words, you know, if you were to say that. Um, Hashem, uh, like the Torah says, right? Hashem uh, descended upon Har Sinai. That's a very dangerous phrase, right? To speak of Hashem as in a location, because Hashem is not in a location. But if you, uh, 
if you say that the Shekhinah of Hashem or the glory of Hashem descended on Har Sinai, like Chazal say, or like Unklo says, so what you mean is God's activity was on Sinai. And that you can say, because God's actions can affect uh, specific places. Okay, so, oh, here's another example I put on the PowerPoint. For example, instead of saying Hashem is in the Mikdash, which is false, right? And Shlomo, when Shlomo built the Mikdash and he had the dedicatory tefillah, he says, you know, um, the heaven of heavens cannot contain Hashem, all the more so this house that I built for you. So like Hashem is not in the Mikdash, but if you, but uh, he's saying that um, uh, if you said Hashem's providence extends continually to the Mikdash, that's very cumbersome. So instead you say the Shechina is in the Mikdash and Shechina means God's activity. Yeah, Rifki? Um, yeah, I have a question on just like how it got to the point where people like when you're growing up, like you really think and even people like adults, like literally think that it's like some physical representation of Hashem. And I don't know if that's more of like just different like sects of Judaism or if it's like my understanding of it. But I just feel like it's completely different. It's like skipping the step step completely and going to like that more like questionable. Yeah. So, so the, the short answer, the short and spicy answer is um, that uh, if you're going to put the blame on anyone, so, okay, there's, 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 there's two causes of it, okay? And the cause is united, unfortunately. One cause is just the default mode that we have that we think of God in physical terms, right? And again, you don't, you don't need proofs of this. Like, that's the whole thing of Avodah Zara, right? Like, like, thinking of God in physical terms, needing a physical representation. And even nowadays, when we don't worship idols, people still want to view God in, in, in physical, physical ways. You know, like I still always remember um, when I went to Israel on NCSY Kolel, then like uh, they were, took us on like the Kotel uh, tunnel tours, you know, and like they got to this point and they, they pointed to the one and said, this is like, like under the Kodesh HaKadoshim and it's like the closest place to the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Okay, everybody Davin, you know, like, like, but the thing is, is halakhically, there's no significance to under the Kodesh Kodashim. Like, that's not a halakh, you know, but like people need to feel like this, this physical thing. So that's like the, I don't think that's a controversial answer. The controversial answer is uh, I place the blame entirely on uh, Hasidus. Okay. Hasidus and maybe uh, Zohar, maybe Ari, I'm not sure, because that's when this doctrine of divine imminence that God is in everything started like becoming popularized i'm not saying that they invented it but they popularized it or that's that's the form in which it took and i think once you start conceiving of of god is in everything or hashem is here hashem is there hashem is really everywhere or the the hashem is the is uh the soul is a you know that the soul is a, a piece of god uh literally or uh, i i saw this horrifying thing i'm not going to say who said it one of my one of my favorite acronym uh, in Tanakh, I saw him say that the soul is chelik aloka mimal mamish and chelik meatsmuso that the soul is a portion of God's essence. And I was like, oh, say it ain't so, you know. Um, so like this idea is very pervasive. Okay, the idea, the the misconception is as pervasive as they think God is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if that makes any sense okay so i that, i think that's why it's such a widespread uh, notion and people don't learn the the uh people don't learn the rich as much as they should you know yeah okay okay so uh so that is rabbi Chay's ex explanation of shina it is it's not it's not contrary to the ramams it's saying we talk about god's actions as a noun not as verbs so here are some examples again okay, i quote our mission in this because i i did this two years ago um when two people learn Torah together, the Shekhinah is among them. We're going to have to understand that. One who disputes with his Rav, it is as if he disputed with the Shekhinah. One who does Kiddush Levana, it is as if he greeted the Shekhinah. One who brings joy to the poor is compared to the Shekhinah. A judge who issues a false ruling causes the Shekhinah to depart. The Shekhinah is above the head of one who is sick. One who walks haughtily is like one who trips the Shekhinah. So without even explaining all these terms, all these terms are treating God's Hashgacha or God's manifest activity and it's just like taking that thing and then condensing it into like an object that we can talk about. It just makes it easier to talk about this. So you can like encode ideas into like the, this concise language. Okay. So Shekhinah. Oh, so based on this, based on all three ideas, here's my working definition of Shekhinah. Shekhinah is that which manifests Hashem's existence via his actions. And by manifest, I mean like W. Tzvi Hoffman, that it is uh, evident. Okay. So I'll, I'll just walk you through a few examples of this. Okay. So um 
let's say one who disputes with his rav, it's as if he disputed with the Shekhinah. So your, your rav is the source of your chachma of Torah, okay? Which it helps you to see God's glory. So, so if you are like going against your rav, it's like you're going against the, the manifest hashgacha uh, 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 of Hashem. Okay, I, obviously these all need to be explained even more. Uh, maybe this is a better example. When you does Kirish Levana, what is the bracha of Kirish Levana? Uh, I don't know um, how many of you said it yet this month, but like, what do we talk about in the bracha of Kirish Levana? I assume, I mean, I assume women say the bracha of Kirish Levana, right? The moon, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, with the moon, yeah. I don't know if women say it, but yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I guess, ten is, I mean, it's funny because it's not a, <laughs> it's funny. It is man grama in the sense that you have a time limit in which to say it. To me, that's why they don't say it. I don't know. I have like, and again, I'm so far, I don't know if it's different from Ashkenazim, but like I've been told not to say it explicitly. Interesting. Okay, yeah, I, I've never looked into the issue. I'm just wondering about it now. I mean, it's no more time limited than like saying a bracha on lightning, you know? Like, uh, okay, but anyway, Kirsh Levana talks about the laws of nature and how God is the cause of the laws of nature. So when you say Kirsh Levana, you're like beholding the Shekhinah in action, which is like the manifest laws of nature that point to God's glory, you know? Um, one who brings joy to the poor is compared to the Shekhinah because God uh, um, lifts up the poor and provides everyone's needs. So you're like acting as like an emissary of the Shekhinah. So all these are like talking about uh, divine activity, okay? Um, and so let's just play this through the initial puzzle of, uh, about the Shekhinah in Shemos. Va'asali mikdash v'shechani b'zocham you shall make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among you. So based on the first definition for the Ramam, what does this mean? It means that Hashem's Hashgah is continually with the Israel on account of the Mikdash. According to uh, the other definition in the Ramam, if you want to believe that this means that, uh, uh, that this refers to a created light inside the Mikdash, I ain't going to say nothing. Okay, like you can believe that. Uh, definition two, Rav David Tzvi Hoffman, the Mikdash manifests Hashgah Hashem as the force which determines the fate of Bnei Israel. And then definition three, mine, based on Rabbi Chait and all these other definitions, Mikdash is a place in which Hashem's existence is manifest by his actions. You see the Hashgacha, like there were open miracles there. You see the Avoda being done, which teaches you ideas about Hashem. There's, it's a place of Chachma, that's where the Sanhedrin is, and where the Levim, and the Kohanim are, and, the, and where Torsh Walpeh is, is centered. It's a place of Yira, where you have the awe of God. So that's what I mean by, like, it's real to you that Hashem exists. And anything that is real to you, that makes God's existence real to you, we can call Shechina. Okay, so it's like a relative term, like, like what is Shekhinah for, for one person, what is perceived as Shekhinah by one person um, is, uh, is not necessarily going to be perceived by Shekhinah as another person. If you were there in my shear last time, my crashing and burning shear, this is like the one idea that I tried to get across, which is that, that me who's in Melech kavod, who's the one who can perceive God's kavod? Only someone who is, uh, uh, has the right mindset. You know, so the Shekhinah is only manifest to people who like are attuned with it. Yeah, Lauren. Um, yeah, I'm getting kind of confused here between like Shrina in terms of like Shrina, because I guess I thought Shrina meant Hashkacha. Yeah. But now you're saying that it's which Hashem's existence is manifest via his actions. Is that the definition of Hashkacha or it's Hashkacha? So, yeah, so Rama is, than... Rama was just defining it as Hashkacha. I'm blending a definition of Rav David Tzvi Hoffman and Rambam. This is my understanding, which is manifest hashkacha. Like okay, in other words, I guess yeah, but I guess I'm just kind of getting, I'm getting a little confused because a lot of those examples where Chazal talk about like the Shechina is there, and I know like the whole point is to not make God physical, yeah. but I feel like talking in those terms makes it seem like God physical. Even hashkacha Hashem being there, it's not God physically there, but it's like right. is it Hashem's so more watching over there or is yeah, it, yeah so so, so the, i don't know the, 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 the god's actions right or god's uh, god's activity so you know hashgacha is not synonymous with god um and uh and and, and as long as you realize that shechina means the activity of god then you're not going to mistake it for being god himself okay I think like a lot of people also get confused because I think a lot of people treat Shina and Hashem as synonymous and that's a big no-no. Like that's the, according to Rabbi Chait, that's the whole reason why Chazal created the term Shina so you could talk about God's actions without people mistaking it for God himself. Right, but I guess like if you say that there's more Shina there, there's more Ashkacha, let's say at the Mikdash, does that yeah. mean that Hashem like has more divine intervention in that yes. place? Yes, yes. 
Yeah, okay. it, it, according to the Raman, it would mean that there's more divine intervention. According to me, it would mean that there is, that it's more uh, evident there, you know, which could be okay. because there's more of it. It could be because uh, people are aware of it. Like, for, I'll give you an example of this. Like, um, when we say that the Shekhinah is over the head of, of a person who is sick, my understanding of that, and I'm not basing this on having researched that statement, this is just my understanding, is when you're in the presence of a person who is, and I think it's not talking about someone who has a cold, it's talking about someone who's like on, you know, on their deathbed, right? Uh, or like you know, terminally ill. It brings to mind mortality and it brings to mind the reality of that the physical reality is not the real reality, that, that there is a judge who's gonna judge you after death and that your soul is the real reality. So it's bringing to mind the, the reality of like God and his, his, his activity of, of being the, uh, the Diana MS, you know? Um, so it's, uh, uh, and then similarly, one who walks hardly is one who trips the Shekhinah. What does it mean to trip the Shekhinah? I mean, in this context, like if you're haughty, you're just not thinking about, about the fact that like everything exists because of God's uh, hashgacha, you know? So it's like, you're blatantly like ignoring God's hashgacha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So that was all for the crash course. So now the question is, does this help us? Oops. Let me close this. Does this help us with our Mishnah? And like I said, I have one idea. Okay. Uh, and uh, let me just really quickly get my water bottle. Hold on just a second. Okay. So anyone want to take a venture uh, uh, to, what the, the, to the main question of two people who sit and learn Torah? Oh, sorry, and there are words of Torah between them. It's as if the Shekhinah is between them. Yeah, Ruki? So it's really, really not creative because it's literally just going based off of what you told us in high school. Like I always visualize like the Rambam chart. Yeah. So I would just think here, like it would be like similar to that, that like the more that you're in line with Hashem's will and the more that you can understand like the Torah, then the more you are deserving of like his Hashkacha and not yeah. of just like the laws of nature. Okay, I think that is a true idea. And I think that that is, uh, um, even though, yeah, it's, it's a application of the principles of Hashgacha. I just, oh, okay, knock something over. Um, I think that's true. And I think that that fits in with the Pasuk also, that the whole idea of God paying attention to it and writing a book of remembrance is that like, you know, like you are getting, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, rewarded for this, right? Yeah, uh, but I think there's something deeper. Yeah, Ayala? So I was thinking of two other ways which it could be. Okay. So either first, just like the words of Torah and like the Chachma in the words of Torah themselves, like reflect like God, yeah. I guess. Um, that was the first way. Okay. Or the second way, I'm not sure if you could say this, but maybe you could say that like people being involved in abstract ideas and Torah and whatever, like the fact that people are animals, let's say, like, have the capability to be like perceiving this knowledge and truth is itself a reflection of God. Okay. And like tell Melo Kim, I guess you could say. Okay. Those are both good ideas. Uh, uh, the second one I want to put aside for a second. Uh, and I want to focus on the first one because the first one is expressed in the Me'iri and that's also where I got my idea from. Okay. Uh, so let's read the Me'iri and then you could take it in Ayala's direction or you could take it in my direction or you could say that they're the same direction. All right. Um, Me'iri says like this. Okay, he says, Rabbi Hanan even tried to says, two who sit, etc. He said that any two people who sit and there aren't words of Torah between them is called a Moshev Leitim. As it is written, he does not sit in the Moshev Leitim and is written afterwards, but only in the Torah of Hashem is his desire. Thus, any place where there are no words of Torah is a Moshev Leitim, even though they do not engage in scoffing since their sitting is pointless. Okay, that's like the everyone else said. But two who sit and there are words of Torah between them, uh, the Shekhinah dwells among them. In other words, they apprehend the glory of their creator. Okay, in Hebrew, that is Shemitoch divrei Torasam Masigim Kavod Boraam. From their words of Torah, they, they uh, grasp the glory of their creator. As it is stated, then those who fear Hashem spoke, each one with his fellow, and, uh, and each one to his fellow implies too. Okay, that's how they're getting from the Pasuk that it's minimum of two people. And it is said of them, Hashem listened attentively and he heard. Um, Okay, yeah, let's stop, uh, not stop there, but let's, uh, let's the rest is um, about the one person. Okay, so here's what I want to say for the idea is, okay? We are, um, we're social animals, 
Okay. We are influenced by it, by other people. Okay. And, and I'm not going to pull out that Ramam that I said, I pull out in every year of, uh, you know, Deus, that we're affected by the people around us. Okay. So the thing is that the way we operate is the more people talk about something, the more of a reality it is. Okay. And, uh, and y- y- you can know this like, you know, through many examples, but I think like, uh, I, I guess maybe one of the uh, sharpest examples is if you believe something and no one else around you believes it, you start to like, part of you like starts to question, like, is this thing even real, you know? Um, and, and it becomes hard to maintain conviction in something in the face of, of uh, you like, you know, otherwise unanimous, uh, like a uh, uh, rejection or disbelief. Okay. So what I think it's saying is like this is, is whenever you get together with a friend or really with any other person, it doesn't have to be a friend, that is a tremendous opportunity to strengthen the reality of the Shekhinah in your mind. And the only thing you need to do to do that is engage in some words of Torah, okay? And by words of Torah, I think that the Me'iri gives us an opening here that is not just words of Torah. Like, it's not like, like in this week's Parsha, like me, me you're afraid not to say, in this week's Parsha, you know, it's anything that helps you to apprehend the glory of your creator. Okay, so it could be like, like a matter of chachma. It could be a matter of science. It could be a matter of anything. But the thing is, is it has to be in a framework that you connect to Yira Hashem or Ava Hashem of appreciating the fact that that uh, appreciating God's existence and His role in 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 the in the universe and and uh, and having an awe for that, you know. And once you do that, what you're doing is you've taken this social gathering and you've converted it into a vehicle for Shekhinah, of making God's Hashgacha real to you. But if you don't do that, if you have a social opportunity and you can engage in Divrei Torah and you don't, that's a Moshe of Leitim. That is a, a, a group of like, you know, the, the, the term that we use, uh, I said Chazal used earlier of uh, Yoshe Kronos, people sit on corners. Uh, like, I think the closest term we have in English is either like, is like low lives. Like, like, like uh, people who like, like uh, when we say a low life, you I mean someone who's not doing anything with their life. Now, again, this is like to a certain extent it's hyperbole because like you might be doing something with your life and that one conversation you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have this conversation, you don't have a uh, talk about uh, Torah, but like it's literally like a low life in the sense that you were created by Telemelechim, you have the ability to perceive Chachma and to recognize Hashem and you meet with another Telemelechim who could do that and you could do it together and you don't, you know, you're just like, you're, you're living the low life. You know, <laughs> you, you know, so, so I, I think the idea, the, the subtle, so what Rivki said is true, that if you engage, to the extent that you engage in Torah, then you will be deserving of God's hashgacha. But I think what this is saying is that it's talking about, uh, about an, a decision point of Shekhinah as a social reality. And the way that you make Shekhinah into a social reality is whenever you interact with someone, you talk about some Torah and that uses that takes that that social feeling that if you don't use it, it's just going to be challenged to whatever nonsense values you have. And it redirects it. It uses it as a way to like enhance, to augment your ability to perceive the Shekhinah. And that's what means that the Shekhinah is benam. The Shekhinah is between you. You know, the, the Shekhinah, this Shekhinah is coming from your interaction, you know, um, and, uh, and, and obviously that lends itself to degrees is that if you engage in a lengthy discussion, that's even better. And if all you're doing is learning that's even better, you know, but all you need is that one little thing. And then you've, 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 uh, you've uh, taken that opportunity to strengthen your perception of the Shekhinah. That's like the, the message of the Mishnah. And I think this answers our questions. So what does Shekhinah mean in this context? It means the, uh, the reality of God's uh, existence is manifest to you, right? Uh, um, and the fact that it's between you means that it's emerging from the fact that you're interacting with this other person and you're acknowledging it together. Uh, how does learning Torah cause the Shekhinah to, to be between them? Because you are, again, you're using this other Telem al to engage in thinking and you're reinforcing it on a social, psychological, animalistic level by, by like both enga- talking about God as a reality, you know, or talking about something that allows you to perceive God as a reality. And how does the puzzle from Malachi support this? Oh, I think this also supports my contention that um, it doesn't need to be Torah, okay? Because what does it say? The, the main part is, it was written before him for those who fear Hashem and those who think about his name. Okay. Name of Hashem means knowledge of Hashem, which is through Torah or through science or through any Chachma. 
And fearing Hashem is really the key thing. It needs, in other words, it needs to be thinking about about something that gives you knowledge of Shem and needs to have, it needs to at least lend itself to like, like having an awe of Hashem or fear of Hashem or some level of subordination to the Chachma of Hashem. You know, once you do that, then God pays attention, which means that you're rewarded. The God paying attention thing really fits in much more with what Rifki was saying, um, that, that God will reward you for it. Um, mm. But I think the Chiddush is in how you use the interaction with, the, with, with your friend. Um, so uh, I've now said my idea and kind of forgot what Ayala said. So Ayala, can you repeat what you were going to say uh, or what you said earlier? And then I'll, uh, and then we'll see if it's different or the same or overlapping. Yeah, the first thing I said? The first thing you said, yeah. Um, I think overlapping. I was saying that the by talking about ideas of Torah, like within the Torah, I guess Hashem is reflected just because like the Torah has so much chachma and whatever in it. Okay, right, yeah. Yeah, so I'm definitely banking on that idea. Uh, and th that's why I said that it's, that's reflected in the Me'iri, that he says, from their Torah, they come to appreciate the kavod uh, habore, right? They come to appreciate the kavod Hashem. Uh, I'm just saying, I'm adding the part about the social thing uh, and, and saying that that's the main idea. And then the second idea you said is that the fact that you're engaging with another Tel Melikim and the Tel Melikim reflects the kavod Hashem, um, is, uh, that's where the Shekinah comes from? Yeah, that's a good idea also. Uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see any problems with that idea that I just, uh, didn't think of that idea. Okay. That's my one idea for the night. Yeah. Ayala. Okay. So first of all, I think that's a really cool idea. Like the social aspect thing of it. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I mean, definitely this is like a much larger question, but I feel like there's like different resistances to that, the doing this thing instead of just like learning Torah. Yeah. And like, Oh, involving okay. yourself in ideas in Great general question. and it would just be interesting yeah. to like i don't know go into okay. that yeah, yeah okay so so i i, I want to comment on my initial thoughts on this uh which is that like you know if you're sitting down to learn then it becomes socially acceptable to talk about learning but if you're in like some sort of like um like uh other type of interaction and you bring in torah you know it, there's something awkward about it. So what accounts for that awkwardness, you know? And I think part of the resistance is that you want to feel like the reality of your social life and your values is one thing. And like God and, and the reality of torments is like another area. Like, you know, it, 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 it's like we want to compartmentalize and not accept that that the entire earth is filled with God's, with God's glory. And like everything is Hashgach Hashem. You know, and like we preserve our little like enclaves of like, this is like my world and my values. Like, don't bring in Torah here, you know? Uh, and I, that, that's my initial thought. I'm, you're right. I'm sure that's a much bigger question, but that, that's a, I'm trying to think of an example of this. Um, I had an example of this recently. I, I can't, uh, yeah, I, I can't think of it. But yeah, it's, it's a good question to think about. Yeah, Lauren? Uh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess following up on that, I don't know, I just, I really think a lot about how, like, my friend group from high school, yeah. like, really shaped who I was and, like, my connection to Torah, and I feel like because I have friends where I talk about Torah or you're all interested in growth, yeah. that really affected me being able to be a growth-minded person, and I just yeah. feel like this Mishnah kind of, like, reflects that where it's not awkward for me to tell someone about what I'm learning about or if yeah. I like think of the uh, idea from Yeshayahu that's relevant to the news or something yeah then it's not it's not it's, it's not weird to say that whereas if I'm with other people that I'm less close with or have different values than me then I'm less hesitant to more hesitant to um to like infuse Torah in like that's, the conversation that's so that's kind of like what I'm thinking about like the who you you choose your friends kind of yeah, that is a great point. It reminds me of is this Mishnah, uh, who is the Mandamra here? Uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, maybe? Uh, Amr Lahem, he said to his students, uh, Go out and see what is the proper path that a person should, should cling to. So the students gave different answers about what is the <laughs> what is the path that a person should cling to, right? That's the uh, one, one sentence answer or one, one uh, word answer. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Ayin Torah. Rabbi Eliezer says, a good eye, which is generosity. Rabbi Yeshua Mir Chaver Tov. So Chaver Tov is like a candidate for what is the path you should cling to, having a good friend. And like, I, I agree with you because I, I have these friendships as well. And like, I, I, I don't know where I would be without my friends. And that's why, like, I think, uh, you know, there was a Q&A in, in Yeshiva last year, I think. And um, 
someone asked, uh, it was a panel Q&A, so it was me and Ayala's dad, Rabbi Fader, uh, and Rabbi Pesach, and uh, I forgot who else was the, uh, maybe Rabbi Sinman, and someone asked, you know, what people should spend, what yeshiva guys should spend their time on in yeshiva, you know, so like, the guy who was asking the question meant, um, like, what should I focus on learning, you know, but Rabbi Fader said, um, after, after people answered the question, Rabbi Fader said, you know, one of the things that you really need to do during yeshiva is cultivate friendships in learning that will last you a lifetime, you know, and uh, because that's really what's going to sustain you once you leave the yeshiva. And, and for those of you who, you know, who did go to seminary, I hope you got some of those friendships. For those of you who didn't or who are out of, are out of seminary, there's still time, you know, you can cultivate friendships now, but I'll tell you like, you know, uh, like it, it gets harder and harder to cultivate close friendships the older you get. Because uh, uh, I, for some reason, about the way that this world is designed, the modern world, like it, those interactions are hard to have. So, like you know, if you if you, if you don't have if you haven't done that yet, get on that right now. <laughs> okay, uh, Rivki. Yeah, I was just wondering because I was also thinking this earlier in the class, and then it was like solidified. Is yeah. this also why we say like I know there are many reasons why we say harusas are very important, and like the point of a harusa is that it's at least with two people. So it's like yeah. the idea of a harusa related to this idea. Yes, that we definitely. Yeah, and and true, you know, there's there's different kinds of harusas. You know, I think people often think about harusas as like you know a learning partner, but a real harusa is like a soul partnership where you're not just involved in learning the text, but in helping each other develop as human beings. You know, and uh, and what Chazal say in the Gemara Tainus. Either harusa or death, you know, like they put it in drastic terms, like, uh, because you're not, you can't fully live without having at least one harusa who's like this. Yeah, so it's important. Yeah, Alex? I feel like this might be a little controversial, but sometimes the inverse can do the same thing for some people, where it's like when you're around people who kind of don't have the same values as yeah. you, it kind of like solidifies like the kind of things you would prefer to surround yourself with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think in, in, a, in a, um, uh, I think someone gave an analogy, said that it was from Rav Hirsch. And I don't know what the analogy was for, but I'm just going to borrow the mushal, not the nimshal, is it's like inoculating yourself. You know, like, like you have, you inject a little bit of the, of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, disease causing agent into you. And then that built up an immunity, you know, that sometimes like being around people who like, I'll give you an example. I was thinking about this the whole time um, when I was thinking about this. So uh, when I was uh, in my yeshiva years, then our family every other year would like go to a, a, a Pesach uh, program at a hotel. Um, and for three years, we went to this excellent program uh, and uh, it was like, you know, it was great in many ways, but one of the things that was great about it is like they had a full base midrash. Uh, I think all the like the waiters that they hired were like, like yeshiva guys. So like, they're always like guys learning all over the place and like they had shirim and stuff, you know, and it was great. We went there three years. And then the last place we ever went to was a different program. Um, and it was, uh, it was a modern Orthodox crowd. Okay. And not only were there no shiurim and no like divrei Torah. During the first days of Pesach, I tried to find a chumash and there was no chumash on the program. They had sidurim and they had min minyan and that was it. No chumash. And I obviously didn't go around like listening at like all the tables, but I'm pretty sure there probably wasn't like a lot of divrei Torah being talked about. And like, I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was, but like in I, the terms I would put here is like, Shechina was not there, you know, like, and, and it was something about the contrast of like the different programs were like a Torah centric program. And like, like this, where there was like, I, I wanted to read, like, <laughs> I wanted to read Chumash. My mom had to go out and buy a Chumash for me. You know? Like it was a, it was, it was a horrible thing, you know? So like, yeah, sometimes meeting people uh, uh, who are not having these values can remind you like what you truly value. The, the, um, the, the, the danger is if you, hang around those people enough, then that starts to rub off on you, you know? Uh, so you like need to, you know, and look, truthfully, a good harusa or a good, good relationships in Torah can be anchors for like this type of thing. Like if you have a good harusa or a good relationship in Torah, whether it's like with a, with a spouse or like a Rebbe or, or, or whatever, you know, a learning group, you can go to work eight hours a day with people who don't care about Torah. And like, it's not going to rub off on you in, in a bad way. Cause you'll come, come back to that anchor, you know? Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Ricky. 
Yeah, can you just quickly go over the Sporno and like what he says about like how much or how little? Mm-hmm. I feel like I just didn't clarify. Yeah. Yeah, Sporno said um, that um, he says two sit and there are no words of Torah between them. This is an assembly of Latim who sit, even though their conversation contains no words of scoffing, since their words contain no Torah, they are considered an assembly of Latim. Uh, the entire con- the entire content of which is nothingness and a temporal matter. So the keywords are being no words of Torah, and the entire content of which is nothingness and temporal matter. So I'm getting from there, and from the words of uh, uh, the fact that no words of Torah between them. That like, if you say any words of Torah, then you're out of this category of the lates. Of this kind of lates, yeah. Okay. So that's all I got for this Mishnah. Uh, I again, there is more to the Mishnah, but uh, I did not uh, succeed in uh, in getting an idea for that yet. Um, so I think what we'll do is uh, next week plan to go on to the next Mishnah. I don't want to come back to this part. Um, so if you think about this part and you want to say ideas, feel free to put it in the uh, the discussion chat. Now that we have a discussion chat, uh, and uh, yeah, all right. Uh, have a good night. And uh, oh, those of you who plan to come tomorrow, so I do have an idea about the Noah thing. But I actually it turned out to be a much shorter idea than I thought. So if we have extra time, we can do a Q&A. So if you have any cues, then uh, bring them. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. And a good Thank job. Can I tell you just one yeah. thing? Sure. Um, I feel like the idea from last week that we learned really helped me process like the results of the Israeli election, like not get too nervous because oh, yeah? I guess like first- Oh I yeah, the government like, thing, yeah. I was being a little nervous, like, oh, it's very far, whatever, far right, and I don't know yeah. how it'll be, but then we learned, like, no government is worse than a government, and I guess I feel like, okay, it's a right-wing <laughs> government, but it's more stable, and they won't have another election in, like, a year, so. Yeah. Okay, that's, know, a, that's good, good. I'm, good, I'm glad it helped, yeah. I'm glad it helped. <laughs> yeah, it really Always helped. nice when it translates into current events, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Right. Have a good night. Bye.